Welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rodolfo Konkwo. This is a continuation of our coverage, special coverage of the 2015 presidential election. We just showed you a profile, uh, an issue-based documentary on the economy and the impact of the economy on this election. We're now going to go to Nigeria to talk to Professor Patu Tommy, who is the Professor of Political Economy at the Lagos Business School. Professor Tommy, welcome to Sahara TV. Thank you very much. I, I understand that uh, you've been accredited to vote. How has this experience hey, yo, man, been what it do is for you? Boy, young moose, you are well, um, the actual process of getting accredited uh, went, uh, went fairly smoothly, but uh, they didn't show up. Uh, in fact, when we went the first time, there was nobody there. Policemen were there, but no INEC officials. I came back and began to call up officials that I know, and then eventually, just about noon, uh, they showed up, hmm. uh, and then we managed to get accredited, and I suppose to now return uh, to vote about this time. Okay. Did did anybody have a problem with the uh, reader card reader over uh, at your polling booths? Uh, in my polling unit, it was going fairly smoothly, actually. Hmm. Okay. Fairly smoothly, well, yeah. how about the turnout? How is the turnout? Turnout is good. Uh, in part of the fact that it came so late, you know, there was a long queue of people waiting to get accredited. Uh, you know, uh, a very nice, polite thing that happened. They said, oh, elders, come to the front and don't join the queue. Mm. So we, the elders, got the chance to get accredited uh, and not stay on the long queue. Mm. Now, across the country, what stories are you hearing and how much is that having any impact on voters? about what is going on in different parts of the country, like the bombing in some parts of the country? Is that it, it, yeah, there's a bombing in Enugu, for example. Of course, there are people who are frightened of taking any kind of risk, uh, especially people who think, oh, is this worth it? You know, politicians are going to do what they will do in spite of us or, you know, and all of that, so why should I take such a risk? Obviously, these, these kinds of things are designed to intimidate uh, there are also stories about um, people uh, intimidating people in some parts of the world. Mm. I've been uh, on Twitter and the social media generally and picking up on some of those. Uh, but uh, I think that generally speaking, it's um, moving along and I hope it works out well. Mm. Now, uh, I know you ran for president in the past. How do you assess the, the, the competitors this time? How did they do in the campaigning? Well, <clears throat> I think that it's probably more important to uh, assess a process than the competing individuals. Uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things that failed in the past, you know, the, the, the setup of the Nigerian uh, political system since uh, uh, 1999 has reflected an economic culture, a political economic culture, in which the elites were just looking for a convenient vehicle to use to share resources that come from rent in the country. Mm -hmm. And the quote-unquote ruling party has been a very, very um, convenient vehicle. And so there is some kind of, a, you know, understanding, it's your turn, it's my turn, go and do as much damage as you can, get your beat, get your share. Classic pre bendal uh, arrangement. Mm. Uh, now, people who oppose that generally uh, have not been in strong enough numbers to uh, uh, come up against the ruling party. And so they, they are coming from small parties, and then they make efforts uh, uh, to form coalitions that have never quite coalesced in the end. And so the ruling party always saw itself in a position to uh, divide and rule as it were. And that was my frustration with uh, trying to engage the process. And I, I committed to a track of helping build a solid opposition party as a, a goal in itself. That was my primary goal. 
And um, uh, at this time around, and credits really must be given to the former governor of Lagos State, uh, Abola Tinubu, for the work that he did. When he first said to me, uh, okay, let's do this thing you've been harassing for, let's do it. I thought, oh, I've been through this so many times, I'm exhausted, I'm tired of talking to all these parties. And I said to him, go ahead, if you succeed, I will follow you. And boy, did he succeed. Mm -hmm. So what has happened really is that success in creating a single party, rather than this pretense to a coalition, created a big enough group to challenge the ruling party. And that is what has defined these elections, not so much the individuals who are running. Of course, they have their, their effect. In some ways, there is a, a rejection of the incumbent by most thinking people. Um, and in other ways, that meant, you know, a, a beginning to look more closely at the opposition uh, uh, candidate. And then people who had all kinds of um, petty misgivings began to rethink their misgivings. And so it needed a more keen contest. Mm. Um, of course, the jury is still out. Uh, we'll find out how it all plays out. But it then made the incumbent and the ruling party um, desperate. Mm. And that desperation uh, created something that is enormously peculiar for me as far as... Um, um, contesting elections are concerned. Now, you all live in the United States. You know that in the U.S., uh, incumbents in such a situation will typically play what is called a rose garden strategy. Mm. Uh, here, it turns out the incumbent, instead of playing the rose garden strategy, came out like the opposition candidate, uh, um, throwing all kinds of mods at the opposition fellow. Mm. And, and that was very peculiar for me. Mm. Uh, but it's a matter of a kind of desperation that I'm, you know, taking hold in in that arena. Mm. And further helped define, again, for thinking people, what the critical issues were. Yeah. Now, let's let's talk about, b before we let you go and vote, let's talk about the economy. Uh, what is in the minds of most voters about the economy as they go to vote? Uh, what is probably uh, 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 strong in the minds of most voters and in the very peculiar situation is that the misery index is at the very worst I can think of in, in Nigerian history. People have never felt more miserable. But there is this strangeness of uh, 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 people who are conversing for the incumbents saying, oh, the incumbent built Nigeria into the biggest economy in Africa. I never heard a lie bigger than that uh, 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 because the size of an economy is not what one incumbent, you know, uh, 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 does in three, four years. Uh, it's something that evolved because of the population, because of all other factors affecting output through the years. Still, uh, that Nigeria, in the rebasing, moving away from the 1990 base to a new base in 2014, now gets reclassified as the biggest economy in Africa. But in any way suggests that the person who's been there for years built it into the biggest economy in Africa. But even more importantly, in spite of that label, uh, it's more miserable to live in Nigeria than in most parts of Africa, including some of the cotton bowl republics on the continent. Mm. So obviously uh, uh, the fact that the Nigerian economy can have just a slight shift in the price of oil and going to a tailspin, uh, exchange rate is collapsing, um, uh, 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 panic measures are being introduced, uh, the budget process is upside down. I show very clearly how the economy has been mismanaged. In fact, I like to describe the Nigerian economy in the last few years as inchoate. Mm. You know, mm. uh, uh, it's been really very badly mismanaged. And the, the uh, 2008 international financial crisis, the global financial crisis, Nigeria literally came out of it on skis mm. uh, because reserves built up by the Obasanjo administration when crude oil prices were at $38, $39 a barrel were there to provide Nigeria a buffer. Mm. And now, with oil prices having been at more than $100 a barrel for a very long period of time, the reserves have been depleted. Uh, and so a small 
change in oil prices leads to a panic that has led to a collapse of the exchange rate that has led to all manners of challenges to the economy. Mm. Now, let, let, me, for anybody to let, me, let me ask you right there. The, the stock market has not been doing well in the last few weeks. Um, and the government is saying that it's because of this oil price. Do you think, as an economist, do you think that's enough reason for what happened, the difference between what it was six years ago and what it is now? Certainly not. I think the stock market has been performing because of um, uh, a sense of uncertainty. I mean, markets are by psychology. The sense that, you know, the, the measures introduced by government were panic measures, they were not well thought through, so who knows what will happen next. And so the markets have gone south as a result of it. Mm. Uh, look, the Saudis, uh, um, I don't think their stock markets have uh, uh, gone south really, because they had their reserves. I, I don't give the example of, of the 2008 financial crisis. It, it, did get, you know, it doesn't get worse than that. Mm. Or, the global economic accent was mm. All right, all right. Uh, Professor Pato Tommy, we are going to let you go and vote. We hope to talk to you again uh, after that experience. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. When we come back, we are still going to talk to people on the field. We have our reporters all over Nigeria, and uh, we're going to talk to voters, and we'll give you a chance to also talk to us, give us your opinion of your experience. Uh, at the voting poll and everything. So stay tuned.